when I study for these mess these messages, I'll tell you what I think about. Sometimes we seem not to be able to come up with enough chairs because there are that many people here. Sometimes there's more empty chairs than full chairs. That's not what I think about. What I think about is this. Only God knows how many William Carey's there are that are going to hear this message. I have no idea how many Hudson Taylors there might be. Young people, older people, who are sitting and listen, and God bless you, week after week, who put up with my halting style that may run across some nugget and may have a fire ignited and may go do something I could never do. I pray God that that happens. I don't know who listens to what we do over YouTube. I don't know. But if you're listening at YouTube, I pray God will ignite something in your heart and that you do something I could never accomplish. I am cutter. After Hudson Taylor, missionaries popped up one after the other after the other and went to all kinds of places all over. D.L. Moody in the United States founding a church movement that reignited the evangelical spirit. Charles Haddon Spurgeon in England, igniting a revival that England had not seen forever. From 1800 to 1900, missions and evangelism and the love for the lost absolutely blossomed the Church of Philadelphia. Amen? Take a look at Revelation 3.8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. He is speaking to the church age when missions became it became a hurricane it became a fire that burned in men's souls Jesus is saying I've opened doors and nobody can shut them but me not your lack of resource not your lack of education not your seeming lack of Clergyness. If you get a divine appointment, I've opened that door. Walk through it. Speak what you know. Talk about the Jesus who's, who's touched your life. Walk through the door. You know, I'd like to say a word about people who say, well, we can't do this, we're too small. We can't do this because of resources. Chuck Smith started in a little church where his uh, congregation and his elders were all upset because hippies were coming to the service and because they were barefooted and dirty, they were damaging the carpet. And Chuck Smith's response was, save the carpet and see these people unsaved? He says, rip the carpet out. Buy new carpet, doesn't make any difference. The reality for each of us, where God guides, he provides. Where God guides, he provides. Now, I'll make this statement, and I've made it before, but I'm going to make it again. Any church that spends a substantial amount of its time pulling it for an offering, any preacher who's got a 30-minute radio program and spends 25 of it 
telling you about special offer number XYZ and for a gift of and pulls all that routine, they're pulling for offerings because, and I'm sorry if some people are offended, because the Spirit of God walked out of that ministry a long time ago. And they're having trouble making ends meet. And the reason they're having trouble making ends meet is because God is in things that end. The reality is where God guides, he provides. That's why we don't take an offering here. We got a box in the back. You want to put something in it? Fine, it's between you and God. The reality is God does not need your money. He's God. The truth of the matter is giving to God is our, pri our privilege and it is a response of a grateful God that knows that there is, of a grateful believer that knows there is a God and that we're not him. Romans 3, 8 again. Oh, Romans. <laughs> Revelation 3, 8. I know thy works, and behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength. Yeah, I know. I know what education you got. I know what you've done in your life. I know that you didn't get saved on your own merit. I know you've done stuff you're ashamed of. There's not a single person in this room that hasn't done something that they wish no one else will find out about. No one. And the fact of the matter is, if you've accepted Jesus, you're clean. He said he would remove your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. That's the truth. That's the gospel. Amen? Amen. In chapter, in Revelation chapter 1, the 17th verse, John falls down on his face as though dead. And in the 18th verse, Jesus says, I am he that liveth and am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Now, as we read down, Jesus references this business of keys, okay? Let's read again. And I know thy works, and behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and has not denied my name. We'll get back to that. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which says they are Jews and are not, but to lie. Behold, I will make them to come and to worship before thy feet and to know I have loved thee. Hold that thought. Now, Jesus specifically says, as we read in this third chapter, that he has the keys. He talks about having the key of David. Now you might say, what is that all about? This is actually a reference to the book of, of uh, Isaiah. The, the, the story here, I'm sorry, it's not Isaiah. It is, Isaiah 22. In Isaiah 22, there's a story about a man who had been appointed by the king to be the guy who kept the key to the treasury of the country. And he's the guy that had access to all the riches of Israel. And it was their custom that this guy kept the key on a great big metal ring. And that he carried the ring over his shoulder so that everybody could see it, that he was the guardian of the key ring. And as the guardian of the key ring, he had access anytime he saw fit. But he did some really stupid stuff. What he did is he went out and he took money from the public treasury. And having money from the public treasury, he built himself an, an elaborate sepulcher, a burial chamber. And then he took money from the public treasury and he bought a whole bunch of chariots. 
he was into sports, chariot racing. And because he had used the money that had been given to God for purposes that had nothing to do with God's purposes, Isaiah exposes this man and a curse is given to him. Jesus here is saying to that church of Philadelphia, with little strength, looking at the task in church history of evangelism, I know what resources you have. And it doesn't matter. Because I have the king of David, I have the key of David. I have the resources to pull this off. Where God guides, he provides. And when you're in a place where he quits providing, it's time to lock the doors. I'll tell you something that's amazed me about our little church here. We've never taken up an offering. We've never asked anybody for money. No one. We don't want your money. We want you in right relationship with Jesus. Uh, for those of you who may not know, I have no idea who gives what. I exclude myself from looking in the offering box. All I get are magnitude figures from our resident really good cook back in the back, Danielle. <laughs> And at any rate, she tells me where we're at with the bank, not who gave what. Danielle, how much is in the bank? Before we um, you know, take out the couple checks, we're sitting at uh, 27000 Our expenses are $1,500 a month. Where God guides, he provides. There are churches of 300 that don't have the blessing we have in this congregation. Where God's guiding, he's providing. And I don't say that to brag. I say that to say, we will never pull for your money. It isn't gonna happen. We're here because Jesus put us here. And when he decides that's no longer what he wants, Okay. We'll pull up stakes and we'll move on. I, I'm hoping that we will all pull up stakes together and go home. And whoever's got control of the bank, they can have whatever's in there. We don't care. The point of the story with the guy in Isaiah, there is an obligation to recognize that if you sincerely believe God has called you to something, that you have no resource and way to pull off. Step out and do it because he will provide. And you'll have a blessing because if you miss God, it'll fall right down on its face and you will not waste your time in something that he doesn't want. And you'll be relieved of that burden. It's okay. It'll work. How many have heard that message in a church? It's a little different. All right. So this is a church that has a love for the lost. Anytime we don't use the resources that God gives, gives us, we are just putting it toward our own gain. It has to be for his purposes. Anything that comes into the church has to be used to accomplish what God wishes to accomplish. Never for the personal wants, for the personal direction of those in leadership in the church. Where God guides, he provides. He opens doors and he closes doors. When Noah had the ark, he gave them a plan that allowed them to build, them, build the boat. And when he got the plans, God told him, leave the door open. And he left it open for the 120 years it took him to build that boat. And when he had built the boat, God called the animals into the ark. No, it didn't. 
God had a plan. He made a way where there seemed to be no way. And when all the animals were in the ark and all his family got in the ark, it was the very hand of God that shut the door. That was God's part. You don't worry about God's part. You get a firm handle on what's your part in the ministry, what's your part in your calling, and no matter whether you're a shoemaker or not, and you take care of your part, he'll open and shut the doors. And don't worry that somebody's gonna shut your door. No, they're not. Only Jesus can shut that door. When he's opened it, nobody else will shut it. Three things to note about the Church of Philadelphia. Number one, it's a church that sees an open door and goes through it, no matter what they see in themselves. Regardless of the task, regardless of the perceived resources they need, Jesus says to them, you have a little strength. The second attribute, the church is feeble and it knows it's feeble. It knows it's not all that in a bag of chips too. But the church is faithful. He tells them that they knows that they're in a time of little strength and little power. Alex and I were talking earlier about where should we be when we know that the outcome is sure. When prophecy tells us what the plan of God is, what should be our part in that? Because no matter what we do, it isn't going to change the plan of God. That is true. And he knows we are of little strength in that way. The reality is, though, he has made us salt. Step up and be salt, even if you know there are people who aren't going to come and taste it. Amen? You can say amen. It's okay. The devil saw you come in your, your reputation shot with him. You might as well have a good time with us. Okay? All right. And then thirdly, the church at Philadelphia did not de deny the deity of Jesus. He told them that you've held fast to my name. In other words, you've declared me to be who I am. The mission of the church is not seminars or messages on how to live a better life. That's not a church. The message of the church is the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. Amen? And that's what a church should be about. All right. The ninth verse. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. The synagogue of Satan. Now I want you to read, I want you to think back to those four levels of interpretation. Okay? Four levels of interpretation are very important. First to the local church. Okay? Second to our day. The day that we are in is part of the church of the Gentiles. And then thirdly, to the time of the tribulation, or to the time that we're in heaven, and then to the time of tribulation and the time of the end. All right? This business of the synagogue is Satan. After the 1800s, when the church had begin, begun to cool again, between 18 and 1900, when things had solidified back again into religious structures, had put away Jesus, had put away his word, and now only had liturgy, ceremonies. During that entire period of time, there were those who, as part of the intelligentsia, deciding what the church should and should not believe, to include all the churches that we've talked about. 
they began to look at scripture and the prophetic sense of scripture and they began to look at the world in which they lived. And they began to say, if something is not within the realm of your experience or if it doesn't make logical sense to you, then it cannot be the basis for interpreting prophecy. It can't be. And they said Israel was destroyed. Because Israel was destroyed, there's no possible way that the prophecies in Isaiah and Ezekiel and throughout the scripture could be referring to a literal Israel because it doesn't exist. And so they began to formulate a theology that was known as replacement theology saying that because Israel blew it, God replaced them with the church. And that the church is now the heirs to the promises of Israel. And because the church is heirs to the promises of Israel, that Israel has been excluded. Jews no longer have a place with God. And that God has forsaken Jews, and it's us. Well, then something happened. There was an interesting book that was written by Hal Lindsey. And the book was called The Road to, to the Holocaust. And what he suggests is something that I believe. He suggests that the seeds to the execution of millions of Jews did not start with Hitler. They started 100 years before. Why? That's when replacement theology got its foothold in America and around the world. The reality was that Jews began to be seen as rejected, as no longer heirs to the promises of God, to the benefits of Jesus because they rejected it. Benefits of salvation. That they had become corrupt and that they were Christ killers. And as much as I love Martin Luther, he said it. Replacement theology. And that idea was carried forward and used by Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler claimed to be a Christian. He was Catholic. The Pope in Rome sanctioned many of the things that the Nazis were doing. Now, before you think I'm bashing Catholics, that's not what I'm doing. I want to point out something simple. Jesus says that there is a curse on the synagogue of Satan. Those are Jews who claim to be Jews and are not. Being a Jew doesn't mean that you were born ethnically a Jew. The scripture says being a Jew is being a Jew in heart, a circumcised heart. But I'm here to tell you something else. There are people who call themselves Christians and are not Christians because they hate Jews just as there are Jews who are not Jews because they hate Christians. Anybody who thinks that we have replaced the Jews in Bible prophecy and that Jesus is through with them are sadly misinformed. And I believe that there's good evidence to say that's who Jesus is speaking to here. Can we look at it one more time? And behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. They have a form of godliness, but have divide, they denied the power thereof. They don't follow the Mosaic law. They don't do the things that Jews say they should. They follow now a liturgical system. But do lie, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. Who? 
Christians who still love Jews. Christians who recognize that when we leave this earth, you know, this really helps in understanding Revelation. The second and third chapter up to the rapture is all about how God dealt with us so that we might be saved. What we find from the fifth to the 19th chapter is all about how God sets forth to redeem Israel. When you break it down that simply, it makes a lot of things really clear. I can't tell you the number of people, well, I can give you some clues as to find out who they are. They've always got a special offer on the radio program and they're always pulling for an offer. Why? Because where God guides, he provides and he's not providing. The reality is Jews are still the apple of his eye. Jews are still people that he loves, just like he loves us. There are three classes of people that are spoken of in the scripture and in the book of Revelation. Three classes. Class is a bad term. Three subsections, all right? Jews, Gentiles, and the church. People who were born of the original people groups of Israel and those who have embraced the Jewish religion. People who do not embrace Jesus but are not born of the Jews, Gentiles, and the church. You know who that is? People who used to be Jews and used to be Gentiles. Whosoever will that came and became that third group. And friend, I tell you, whosoever will is going home. You know, a little preview, you know what the fourth chapter opens up with? And after those days, after what days? After we're gone. And he begins to speak of the gloriousness of heaven and what we're going to see. But it'll only come after those days. Now, I just want to let you know, I condensed about four pages of notes, okay? All right. Just very quickly, for those who seem to think that Israel has been written off, I want to refer you to Romans, the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th chapters. It is clear as crystal that God is going to deal with the Jew again. Don't write them off. And remember the admonition that God gave in a promise to Abraham. Those that curse, those that bless you, I'll bless. Those that curse you, I'll curse. If you curse the Jew, you're, you're bringing curses right into your own life and family. If you bless the Jews, if you rely, refuse to allow your government to stand against the Jews, Alec asked me, what should, our plan, what should our stand be since we can't alter anything with our own government? Stand up and speak against politicians who speak against Israel. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. The reality is you bring blessing to your own family and life. You ever wonder why our country is going through some of the stuff it's going through? Why our economy is built on a false premise? The stock market going through the roof? You know why it's going through the roof? It's going through the roof on quantitative easing and debt. It's false. It's a fraud. It's not real. And it's going to come crashing down very soon. Very, very soon. God is not finished with the Jew. Read those three chapters. All right? All right. Israel is the apple of God's eye. And we should not forget that. The synagogue of Satan, in my humble opinion, and it's and there are a lot of other Calvary folks, John Corson, uh, uh, Chuck Smith, tremendous number who agree with the same interpretation, and that is this: 
Those of the synagogue of Satan, of the Jews. They are those who hate. And those of the synagogue of Satan today in the prophetic sense, they are those that say they are Christians and hate the Jews. So, we make it out of another page. Revelations 3.10. But thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. He says that you kept the word of my patience. I want to read 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter in the fifth verse to you. May the Lord increase you and abound you in love, one for another, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness, even before our God, our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all of his saints. We are told that God is establishing us in the patience of waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, he says that we are established in waiting, knowing that we will be caught away because we will return with Jesus at that time. In the last days, the church of Philadelphia that has little strength has kept his word, has not denied his name. The church that sees an open door, and they see an open door, the same door, and realizes that Jesus opens them and that nobody can shut them, no matter how small their strength. The church that gives out, realizing that the treasures of heaven are available for the work of the gospel, whether it happens to be in the checkbook right now or not who makes a commitment to stand up because Jesus said, set out and do it, no matter whether it seems anybody's walking with you or not. You know the chorus that we sing, and it has great merit. I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, yet I will follow. Regardless of whether my wallet's empty or not. Regardless of whether it seems like anybody's going to get behind what God showed me or not. Get up and go. If the day ever comes when there is nobody that shows up in a chair here for one reason or another, watch YouTube because there will be a message. There will always be resources for the work of evangelization there just needs to be a heart for it. He makes it clear that the church is in need of the word. Listen to what he says again. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. You've looked into the word. You've recognized what I've said. And you have not taken the attitude that because world circumstances don't seem to fit and that we must not really be understanding it. Do you remember what we said when we opened this message? That there is a blessing to those who read and understand this word. They wrote off the idea that Israel was still in God's plans because Israel was destroyed and had been gone for hundreds of years. In 1948, they had a new set of circumstances to deal with because Israel came back and became a nation in a worthless piece of dirt. There are sermons that you can find from before the time that Israel was rebuilt as a nation where they said it can never happen. Israel is just a dust bowl. 